Donald Trump has openly vowed, if reelected, he'll be a dictator on day one. That he will weaponize the Department of Justice against his political enemies. Okay, let's focus on that last one. The first one's a ridiculous, and we all know that, but that second one is extra important to focus on. Jeffrey Clark is here. He's a former U.S. Assistant Attorney General, now Senior Fellow at the Center for Renewing America. He was indicted over the 2020 stuff. He was one of the 18 people alongside Trump who were indicted in those RICO charges in Georgia. Jeffrey, how are you doing, sir? Good. How are you doing, Mike? Good to be here. Good. What was, what was the exact indictment against you? What was the claim? <laughs> The claims are really quite silly, and I don't think a lot of people understand this. So there's a, a claim that I participated in a vast Georgia RICO conspiracy to steal the 2020 election for Donald Trump, and they have no evidence of that whatsoever. They're just, they assert everyone who they want to put into this one indictment that they're participants in a conspiracy, and then, you know, we're forced to try to extricate ourselves by saying, what evidence do you have of a conspiracy? And all they'll really tell us is, well, we'll show you at trial. But the point is, they should have to uh, at least have some basic allegations that put you on notice of why they think that multiple people were conspiring. And then the second thing is that I engaged in something that we really cannot find any prior examples of in Georgia law or, or elsewhere, which is that I engaged in an attempted false writing and that uh, a letter that I worked on internal to the Justice Department that never should have been released to the public and first was uh, leaked by anonymous leakers to the New York Times in late January 2021 was executive privileged, it was law enforcement privileged, it was privileged five ways to Sunday, I won't give you the full litany. Uh, and, you know, nevertheless, this, this letter was released and the argument was that uh, I was attempting to lie in the letter, even though the letter never left the Justice Department or the Oval Office, it was simply debated inside the halls of those two buildings, which it's uh, the president's prerogative and the Justice Department's prerogative to advise the president to do, as we now know, especially from the July 1st Trump v. U.S. immunity decision, which has a discussion of the very uh, activities I participated in and says that they are absolutely immune and the president can talk to the Justice Department and ask them for advice about whom to investigate or prosecute as he sees fit. Guys, I want to focus on that second one for now. We'll go back to the first one. So the second one, so you're saying in this letter, you were advising the president on what exactly? So the uh, the letter, which you know, it's it's painful at some level to be discussing it because it never should have been released because it is executive privileged, but uh, the Justice Department released it to the January sixth committee, and from there it's it's gone uh, all over. The, it was a draft letter that would have gone from three officials at the Justice Department. Uh, myself being one of the three, to the Speaker of the House in Georgia, the President of the Senate in Georgia, with a CC to Governor Kemp, indicating that because the Georgia legislature through a Senate subcommittee uh, in that state had investigated the election and concluded that there was enough information there to want to conduct further information, uh, further investigations, and that uh, there were significant election irregularities, at the very least, revealed as part of that. The letter, therefore, recommended that the Georgia legislature should, as a whole, convene more investigations of that election, and that it had the constitutional power under the U.S. Constitution to call itself into special session, even if Governor Kemp would not use his state law powers to call them into to special session. That was all the letter okay. said. It's quite quite modest so in terms of- what's illegal about that? Exactly, there isn't anything illegal about that, but it's claimed that uh, there were others at the Justice Department who disagreed with me, uh, that they thought that they had investigated the 2020 election fully. And even though they admitted actually, and they admitted on the stand in the uh, my bar case where I was tried at, from the end of uh, March into the first week or so of April of this year, that they had not investigated really the, uh, the, the investigations of Senator Ligon who chaired the subcommittee that I mentioned in the Georgia Senate. So 
you know, it was clear that they didn't want to do any further investigations. They had concluded uh, that uh, the election should just go forward uh, as, you know, state authorities had certified it. And then as ultimately Congress would certify it on the wee hours of uh, January 7th. But uh, my view was that it needed extra investigation. And I don't see why recommending that as a violation of the law at all. And again, the Supreme Court declared that advice and the draft letter that I put together to be something that was uh, the president's absolutely immune for. Of course, on, your, on the first point, the RICO charges, how did you get wrapped up in a RICO charge? Well, I think the RICO uh, process in Georgia as wielded by District Attorney Fonnie Willis is a kind of catch-all for her to create massive cases where what she says to the media in layman's terms Mike is uh, she can tell the full story there, right? Which really means that she can, you know, stitch together a bunch of people who may have, you know, some generic connection, but in reality, especially, you know, at common law, they would be entitled or under U.S. constitutional law and due process, they'd be entitled to, to separate trials. She can try to fuse them all together into one gigantic trial where it would go on for months and months and by the end, you know, a lay jury is going to be so confused about what happened that as if they think someone did anything wrong somewhere, they'll just paint everyone with the same brush. So that's what she so uses Rico for. And, and that's and she's been using it as well. She used it first to go after uh, some people in the Georgia public school system who were cheating on standardized exams in terms of how they were reporting scores. And now she's also using it uh, against this rapper Young Thug in a trial that's also become a, a national spectacle because of all the, the due process violations there. He had the judge having ex parte, which means you know contacts without the other side present with the DA's lawyers, uh, and they were scoping out how they would continue the case. I mean, it's a it's a total nightmare. And you know, uh, Fonnie Willis thinks she can use Georgia Rico like this. We obviously disagree, and there are going to be a lot of big legal issues there coming down the line if she is not removed from the case. And that there's an appeal pending about that, Mike. How can they not tell you specifically, or each person, but you specifically, what you're being charged with exactly? Isn't that a constitutional right? It is. There's a, uh, a doctrine called uh, fair notice. You have to have fair notice of what the charges are against you. And then the Georgia law in this is also strong, right? An indictment that on its face doesn't tell you really what you did wrong is something that cannot uh, stand. Uh, you know, the, the Georgia term for this is the you must get an indictment that is perfect in form. And we don't think we remotely got an indictment that's perfect in form. And look, it also came out, Mike, uh, to go to your opening clip of Kamala Harris talking about weaponizing the Justice Department, uh, you know, you know, in a turnabout trying to throw that onto Donald Trump as opposed to on Joe Biden and herself and Merrick Garland, is that uh, Fonnie Willis was communicating with the White House counsel and communicating with the January 6th committee. And for that reason, we believe they must be coordinating with the U.S. Justice Department as well, but at least with the first two entities, the White House Counsel's Office federally and the January 6th committee. And we asked for the documents about that and Fonnie Willis would not give us uh, them. So we uh, took her to court in front of Judge McAfee, who has the case uh, before it was frozen for this appeal about her disqualification. And we said, look, you know, the." The evidence here that you would try to use against me is privileged and confidential under a whole host of federal laws. And we think you were consulting with the White House Counsel's Office to try to get through that and get you know, the documents so you could introduce them. And they refused. And so we want to see this correspondence. And uh, the, you know, she would not give it to us. The judge did not give it to us. He placed the documents under seal and he declared that they were not uh, necessarily evidence of my innocence because the failure of uh, on the part of Fonnie Willis to be able to prove something is not equivalent to me not actually being guilty, which we also found to be a big head scratcher. So there are secret documents <laughs> of coordin coordination between the federal government in two branches and Fonnie Willis. Uh, and you know that just can't come to public light according to the judge, which we find remarkable. Wow. Okay, so we got about a minute. What is your moral of the story for everyone watching right now? We've had so many cases, we have more coming up, stories 
of these like wild abuses of the justice system and spit, uh, twisting things that were never intended to be meant for this type of case and to try to get people. Someone's watching right now. What should they be concerned about? I think they should be concerned with the breakdown of the justice system and the creation, Mike, of a two-tiered system of justice. I mean, I think that uh, I would not remotely be under uh, all of these attacks, nor would President Trump, if we were Democrats, if we were liberals. It's the fact that we're strong populist conservatives that has subjected us uh, to this. And so if you're someone who agrees with us out there, you're subject Uh, just like the January 6th defendants, for instance, to being the targets of this weaponized justice uh, system. We have to get back to a neutral application of the law. And we also have to get away from something which I think is a big driver of this, which is the idea that somehow uh, President Trump and his administration, which actually brought us a lot of peace and prosperity, you know, were unique threats to the republic. And so therefore, if you're in a world involving Trump or adjacent to Trump, all the rules are out the window and we have to try to find some way to nail you. I think that's very dangerous. That's a communist legal proposition. It's not a proposition of American constitutional law. Yeah, we'll get to that. We'll find the crime. Jeffrey Clark, Clark uh, Senior Fellow, Center for Renewing America. Jeffrey, thank you very much. Keep up the keep up the fight. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, more coming next. We'll talk about the TSA uh, and Tulsi Gabbard. And also, uh, as just mentioned, we'll talk about some of the J6 defendants as well. It's coming up next right here on The First TV. 